أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل على سيدنا محمد في النبي وصل على سيدنا محمد في المرسلين وصل على سيدنا محمد في الملائكة الأعلى إلى يوم الدين اللهم افتح لنا فوت العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم أمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله number one you know whenever we begin these type of gatherings mentioning Allah and His Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم that brings a different nature to it you know instead of just a gathering that there's uh, physical beings there's also two metaphysical beings angels and different blessings begin to descend into the realm Alhamdulillah, we're also to in a, I guess you would say, uh, would say a pursuit of knowledge tonight, inshallah ta'ala. Not just knowledge of the, I guess you say the phenomenon of individuals converting to Islam within the penal institutions of America, but also to the pursuit of self. Because many times we don't understand that we're mirrors of one another. And even the things that we see that are disturbing within the world around us, they, it's a reflection of really what's on in the reality of the hearts sometimes. And what happens on the plane of reality in this world is what's inside of the hearts of humanity. So alhamdulillah, but you know, with the, the, mir the miracle of Islam is that it comes and it corrects and it refines things. And it begins to beautify things. And alhamdulillah, tonight uh, we are honored, first and foremost, to make it here. <laughs> you know, it, it's a big uh, situation to travel. I know we came probably about 500 miles uh, to be here tonight, to be with you all. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for not only allowing us to get here, but also too for us just in general, to be here and to be believers who are conscientious of the journey that we're, we're going back to. You know, there's about 350,000 individuals within the United States of America that identify with Islam and they're incarcerated in some form or fashion. Now if we take a look at that, that's a pretty significant number. Especially when there is about two million of them, there are two million people that are incarcerated just in general. So that means that there is more than 10% that are Muslim. And alhamdulillah, when we take a look at just the history of incarceration within inside the United States of America, it's a very dark one. Uh, the base of it really was, was built to incarcerate blacks. To begin to put them into a situation where they would be cut off from economics, they'd be cut off from family, and basically, basically really be uh, put back into slavery. That's the basis of where this came from. And then as it evolves, and we evolve with Jim Crow, and we evolve with different things, uh, there was different mechanisms and different things put into place within inside of societal structures to kind of facilitate individuals going into that place. And even certain stigmas that we'll probably learn tonight, such as the super predator narrative. Meaning that individuals were in such a state that they were unredeemable, that they should be locked up like animals and sent there to die like a stray dog that would just sit in a cage and everybody neglects them. This is really some of the deep, darker realities of what exists in the prison systems in the United States of America. And not only that, we have now the evolution of still slavery going on, which is pretty close to slave labor now that they institute for them to do certain jobs and produce certain products in still the same way. But inside of this place, which is, hap which is interesting, as we begin to maybe go a little bit deeper tonight, you're going to see a couple different things. Even if people have been incarcerated unjustly, and they are, whether quote-unquote justly, if that really exists, then that's another debate for another time. But there's a beautiful part where people come to the end of their cells. And then they find their cells with inside of this. They find truth. Inside of these moments of distress and depression, and questioning even their own validity of their own lives, they find true life, Islam. 
and they find the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even if they don't have a father, even if they don't have a guide, they find a guide that they read about in a book, and it touches their hearts so much that they begin to follow them, and they've never even seen this individual. So it shows you something about not only the truth of Islam, but also to the effects or the things that dwell with inside of our hearts. So tonight I ask you one thing, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to introduce you to some of my best friends and some of the best people that I've ever met in my life, and I tell you that with no reserve. And the stories and the things in which they have gone through have blown my mind. And all of these individuals up here at some point had some form of life sentence, and they told them that they were never going to go home. They were never going to be good enough people to be in society. And that they, they were not worth even, you know, being thought of. And they've been some of the most miraculous people that I've seen and gone some, through some of the greatest struggles and achieved many heights of really transferring experiential knowledge to others. And not only transferring this beautiful knowledge, but also to touching the hearts of individuals and changing the way in which their conscious works, because Allah has given that ability. Um, one of the things that I was incarcerated for 10 years myself, and I took my Shahada when I, in 2008, now that I remember. And I found Islam in, with inside a prison, so I, I'm telling you this from experience. And then one of the things that I was really drove to do after that was not only seek knowledge, and I came to California, um, I drove out here and lived at a campsite and I did a lot of different things, but I was actually very um, compelled to go back into the same place that I was at one point and try to help people to try to not only discover some of the beauties of Islam that are not really taught in these places because they don't have access to information, they don't have access to even family sometimes, and they definitely don't have access to the Muslim community because the Muslim community with inside of the penal institutions of America are the most underserved community, period. So they're also to a minority, and many of them are minorities. So they're a minority in a minority. And through being compelled to go and actually visit, I learned not only many things, but also to have seen just in general a, certain, a couple of certain trends that begin to really go throughout the United States of America. Is number one is that this population is super underserved. That's one. Number two is also to... The type of Islam that usually is promoted within these places um, doesn't really show the individuals who they are, their value, their worth, and that they're, they can actually get past some of the worst aspects of themselves that they found within in maybe the, the experiences that they had or even the crimes that they committed. Also, too, there has been a very toxic definition of love and what love means, and what love is. And many haven't even experienced love. They've never experienced maybe a mother's warm hug, or a father's kiss on the head and being proud. And if they did experience some of these situations, there was there's, there's a disturbance. Many, there was a, many times in, intoxicants introduced into a family structure in a way that it seemed like it was normalized. That turbulence and, and chaos and also to disturbance, there was none actually in, in, in the minds of many of us. So, but with inside of this and beginning to actually go up and begin to speak with individuals, you begin to see how Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, covers them with mercy in much profound ways. And the reason why these brothers are here is one of the things that this was like a phenomenon that happened. Uh, when I, this is the first time of me going in uh, to the prisons um, after being incarcerated. And just applying certain, I guess you would say, uh, methodologies that I've learned from when I came home and I began to actually study with different shiuk and then saw some of the brilliance inside of these individuals and not only seeing the brilliance, but all of these individuals, their life sentences began to be unfolded and taken off and then they're home now. And for us to be here, I'll be honest with you, it's just a miracle. Because we were all in the prison together, and me being a volunteer, and we're all sitting on the rug like this doing thicker together. And Tobias had life without, and he wasn't getting out. He wasn't, he wasn't either, or sometime, it was sometime later. And Kadir made it out. I don't know how, but he did. He made it out. 
<laughs> they made it out. But it was something really phenomenal because not only did we begin to actually do dhikr together and learn about ourselves and learn about the, some of the deeper dimensions of the soul and the capabilities and the possibilities, but the Prophet Wasallam used to visit them. And this is all real things that I'm telling you tonight. I'm not telling you anything that's sort of really miraculous. And for us to even be here, um, you know, I, I originally, I'm from, my name is Jesse Maroney, and we represent a organization called Link Outside. And what we do is we service individuals who are incarcerated in four, 46 different states, and we provide correspondence first and foremost. Any letter that comes through us, the, I think the 14,000 that we've had, there's a letter that goes back with some information about what we provide, who we are, and also to some upliftment to about remembrance of Allah, remembrance of their selves, who they are, what they mean to us, and what their letter means to us. Also, too, we provide educational material in the, for, in the, in the, in the form of uh, courses, curriculums, and also to self-help programming. Also, we have changed, I don't even know how many, because it's about 35,000 books at least, that we have changed the structure of how libraries, Islamic libraries across the country are inside of prison systems as well. So that now they not only just focus on, you know, I guess you would say, just some of the really confrontational methodologies of pre presenting things, but more of a purification of the heart. What is some of the secrets of divine love? Which actually, if you ever read that book, these are the brothers who inspired that book. Because she actually came with us on a prison visit, came with me on a prison visit. I met her after getting out of prison. And she, after she met these brothers, she wrote the book. Because they told her that she should write a book, because she does beautiful poetry. I don't know if anybody knows uh, the book that I'm talking about. It's called Secrets of Divine Love by A. Hilwa. And she met them, and she, she was so overtaken that she wrote the book. It's a bestseller. And I think they, they taught a curriculum here on it too as well. But we offer library donations that change the way in which Islam is presented, dealing with a lot of self-help and also to purification of the soul, along with the rules and, and fiqh and putting in the interpretation of fiqh. What is the meta, metaphysical interpretation as well? But also too, we provide prison visits, which we have gone probably over 500 visits within California alone. And one of the beautiful things is that with consistency and patience and perseverance, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed us to teach a course that was actually recognized by the state of California to actually take off time off the sentences of individuals. And that was just a curriculum on the practical implementation of Islamic belief. So many achievements have been made, but the, one of the biggest achievements is that they got here. And that not only that, that Tobias was recognized to do the commencement speech by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf as well, and many different things that we have seen. Uh, that these individuals have done miraculous things, which you'll get to know in just a moment. I will hand off the mic and be off of this for the night and just kind of watch. But one of the things that I think I want everybody just to understand is this. Listen, in your mind, if one thing you get tonight out of all the, the miracles that come out of them, is that in the United States of America, at least, we need to really begin to figure that a part of our zakat needs to go to this reality. This prison industrial complex reality. And it's not much that we're really asking for with except education material, books, a little bit of correspondence, and a little bit of actual in-person uh, presentation of different classes and everything. Because They'll tell you what that means to them. But ultimately, again, the personalities that these brothers possess are just examples of what is lying across the country. What is lying across the world, to be honest with you. What is, what's the potential? The personalities that they possess really touch the heart of youth. Really touch the heart of some of the forgotten in our community. Really inspire individuals to take it to the next level because some of the things that they have faced, you start to say to yourself in a very real way, wow, I'm not even going through half of that. And it makes you readjust and reassess. So I'm going to, inshallah ta'ala, hand it off to Tobias first and we'll go down the line. Inshallah ta'ala tonight. But please, I would suggest, if you have questions, um, please take them and take them seriously for the Q&A. Um, if you have any issues with inside of yourself, I'm really 
close to 100% sure that you're going to get some answer from what the life that they talk about of themselves. Some of these brothers have gone through the deepest levels of depression and, and got it completely out just from the love of the Prophet Islam, just from beginning to unify together and beginning to actually come outside of themselves and really uh, do things for the greater good. So I think, inshallah ta'ala, I've, I've said enough and I'll go over some more statistics at the end, but uh, this has been a beautiful ride. Alhamdulillah, we, we've made it here. And so, I, so our brother Sahih has just gotten out just a few months ago and got married already. I got married. You know, so these are, these are really good things. And Alhamdulillah, um, and a few of them are going to be having children soon. He's, he's got two. He got two for one. Inshallah, his wife will be having twins. So uh, these are really miraculous things. And, um, they, they, you know, these brothers provide something that has touched my life and my heart and, and made me continue to do this work for whatever reason that it may be that Allah keeps driving me to do it. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Inshallah ta'ala, Tobias, if you could, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Allahumma sadala Sayyidu Muhammad. Wa akhli Sayyidu Muhammad. Uh, I've been blessed uh, to speak on behalf of these Muslim men and the thousands that possibly been um, affected positively about my presence in the California penal system. Uh, but today is very uh, special uh, to me. In 1991, I was arrested under the narrative of the super predator uh, narrative, which just meant that we were irredeemable, you know, we could not be cured. Uh, I was a very young person, uh, adolescent, but I was a Muslim uh, from a Muslim father who was here uh, today, hmm. who traveled 3,000 miles uh, to see the community that has em embraced his son, uh, his eldest son, his first son. The son in which, in 1970, he rose in the air and he said the response to the revolutionary movement of the 60s was me. The work that we have done uh, is in the life of these three men. And these three men represent so many men who didn't have fathers, who didn't have any kind of spiritual community or compass, who come from the most trying of circumstances and situations. I've been here for commencement, as the Brother Jesse has said, of Zaytuna. And these were the men who I sent the pictures to, to inspire them. Uh, through this community. Uh, I've gone on Umrah twice. Uh, these are the men in which we may do for at the Kaaba. We've uh, traveled throughout uh, Morocco. Uh, and by Allah's leave, uh, we've gone to various maqam with the brother Jesse and the sister Shema. Uh, through the, I guess, the kindness of a link outside.
to allow these kinds of men to know that there is a Ummah who loves them. That the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, knows them. And they are welcome to come out of places in which all of us have done our entire adult lives. I have my younger sister Tahira here today, who's never heard me speak on panel, but she's my first student when I was 10 and she was three. The circumstances in rural South Carolina where there wasn't a match did that I seen or knew at the time due to the divorce of my parents. So me and Tahira will say El Fatiha. Kuhuallahu Hadda, I'm ten, eleven, just trying to hold on to the Islam that my father had taught me and give it to my baby sister. So she's here today. As I pass uh, the microphone to this amazing gentleman, Abdul Qadir, <clears throat> we just say thank you. I'm not going to name certain names because they don't like for me to name them. But they know who they are for your hospitality, for your kindness, for your generosity. You can't imagine 30 years in prison where they couldn't stand you for your skin and they really couldn't tolerate you for your deen where we were hurt for praying, you know, we starved during the months of Ramadan. And so to come here and to prove the narrative incorrect, to prove the narrative wrong, constantly, daily, So, uh, Alhamdulillah, 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 uh, personally thank you and I introduce you to a very close friend and brother, uh, our brother Abdul Qadir, Salamu Alaikum. Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you, brother. Um, I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak before you. My name is Abdul Qadir. I received this name while serving an 18-year prison sentence uh, in Pelican Bay State Prison. Pelican Bay State Prison is considered to be one of the most dangerous state prisons in California. And at the age of 18, I entered there. This story starts off at the age of 13, uh, coming from this uh, disabled home no father in the home, my mother struggling to do the best she could, but got caught up in the drug epidemic that was sweeping through it. Los Angeles, California in the 1980s, and she became a victim of that. As a result of that, me and my eldest brother had to fend for ourselves and defend our streets, and what we believe was our street family, which became our gangs. I got heavily involved in gangs at the age of 13, and quickly began to incorporate that as my, my dean, as my life. Um, it's still a part of my life. It's still a struggle in my life. However, while serving this 18 year sentence, which again, I wanna say started at the age of 13 years old, coming out of the house looking for food, looking for clothes, shoes that fit my feet, started me off stealing, started me off robbing, started me off doing anything I could to satisfy what I believe was needs that I had in my life. Shortly thereafter, at the age of 13, me and a friend of mine decided to rob a supermarket. And in the opportunity to do this, we were in there 
brandishing our weapons. I had a bat, he had a gun, and there was an undercover officer inside of the place. So in this exchange, the undercover officer revealed himself, yelled out a few instructions that we didn't hear because we were heavily intoxicated. And uh, in that missed opportunity, the officer shot me. He shot me in the, what they call the lower left mandible or the jaw. It took out my teeth and lodged itself in the back of my throat. Uh, Subsequently, with that, my friend was killed by the officer as well. So they put me in jail for murder robbery. They convicted me of the murder of my friend and the robbery that we was committing together. This then started me off on a prison stay, a long prison stay. It extended a little beyond 18 years. And uh, I was very upset and discontent with it. I stayed in prison under a juvenile life sentence for three years before me and a few friends of mine from this area, actually the Bay Area, conjured up a plan to escape. Uh, I was always ingenuitive. I was always a survivor. I was always somebody that can figure things out no matter what the circumstances was. And uh, in our genius, we mastered, minded, and successfully escaped from prison. And uh, in the midst of doing that, we committed more crimes. And again, this is where the 18 year sentence in Pelican Bay began. Uh, that prison sentence ultimately challenged me because I didn't know who I was. I was suffering from what was called low self-esteem. I had no value on my life. I was always the first one to run out there and sacrifice myself, uh, really just to prove that I was more than what my circumstances described me as. Um, just to speed it up a little bit, I did a rough stint in prison, fighting, um, arguing, uh, politicking on the yard. Um, constantly in trouble um, as if I had a life sentence. That's why I was left out of the life conversation because I didn't have a life sentence. I had 18 years. But the way I did my time, I did it just like they did theirs. Um, and that got me in a lot of trouble. I spent a lot of time in what's called the segregated housing unit. It's a sensory deprivation tank. That, this is a mile underground in Pelican Bay. When you go into that place, you never see sunlight, natural sunlight anymore. All you hear is echoes live inside of a silo. Um, you never actually feel the breeze. All you feel is the filtered air from the air conditioning. So ultimately what you are is in a sensory deprivation tank. This sensory deprivation tank for human beings becomes a slow killer. And uh, that ultimately is where I had to stop and look at who I am and what I'm doing. Um, there's a dark mirror in prison and it exists not on the walls, it exists within yourself. And when I seen myself in this low state in Pelican Bay State Prison, I knew that I had some issues. I knew that I had problems. I just didn't know how to solve them. And there was no solution for me. I had no idea what Islam was uh, outside of movies like Malcolm X and stuff like that. Um, my family uh, related to Christianity, although we didn't practice it. Um, speeding the story up just a bit, uh, I'm in prison and now I moved out of the segregated housing unit angry because I knew a part of me was suffering, but I didn't know how to answer it. Uh, ultimately, they transferred me down to Calipatria State Prison, which was a, uh, it was a prison down in Southern California, one of the hottest prisons in Southern California. And um, with that heat came a lot of energy. It was what's called the gang headquarters. So all the gangs converged at this one particular place and it was a very violent and dangerous place. Uh, in this state, I had to become my worst self, which is I had to match the energy that was in that environment. Um, being a skinny guy, I was always uh, familiar with weaponry and all these other different ways to defend myself. and um, not bragging, but I never lost a fight in there. And this state of just trying to exist without addressing my humanity ultimately led me to a breakdown. A breakdown in the worst way in front of the whole yard. I was up playing basketball, and uh, the chaplain at the time was calling me over to intercom to come to the chapel and hear the news that he had. The news that he had was that my grandmother, my only uh, active family member at the time, 
was uh, she had passed away. And I knew that that was the case. I just wasn't ready to address the issue. So he comes out to the yard in his fine regalia and he just stands there by the basketball court waiting for me to acknowledge him. And uh, finally, out of frustration, I tell the guys, give me a give me a break. Give me a time out. And I go speak to the chaplain. He says, hey, man, I'm sorry for interrupting you and having to address you on the yard. But uh, your grandmother passed away. So I slap him on the shoulder. Oh, it's all right, chap. And run back out to the basketball court. Uh, so now I'm trying to play ball with the other friends of mine. And mind you, I'm the gang leader on the yard at the time. Uh, you know, they heard the news and I was still trying to play the game out. And they're trying to like, hey, man, just take a pause. Like, you don't want to sit down for a minute and digest this. So I'm like, no, nah, man, let's just keep playing. Uh, because, you know, we're trained not to address our emotions. We're trained not to cry. And uh, I was trying at that at that point to hold on to whatever sense of being hard I had. And uh, I felt it waning. So I, I pressed the game to just continue forward until finally me and my friends, people that I, I had authority over, were out there fighting. They're not necessarily fighting me. They're trying to stop me. But all I see is enemy. All I see is pain and hurt. And I knew at that moment, not at that moment, but I knew then that I was having a breakdown. A breakdown is real. When your nervous system overloads you, when your mind has pressed itself to the ends of delusions and confusions and trying to distract itself from what is, that was the breaking moment for me. And when I broke, I fought the police. I fought the guys on the yard until finally they corralled me and had to literally carry me off the yard at about eight, eight officers. This episode led me to another dark tunnel in my life when I went into the mental health situation. In prison, mental health is not a safe place. You're dealing with criminals with mental health conditions with free reign to do whatever they want because they have no co uh, cognitive skills. Uh, in this environment, I, I, I began to understand that I do have issues, but it's not that bad. Yeah. It's not really that bad, but in the instance I began to be real. I wasn't lying to the psychologist. I wasn't trying to get medication. I wasn't manipulating the system. I was being honest. Hey, this is who I am and this is what I've been going through. And if you have help for me, then help me. And um, a few doctors believed me. It was one doctor in particular, Dr. Aspinall, who took me serious. She never used to look up from her paper when she talked to me. But when I expressed to her who I was and what I was going through, she finally looked up at me and she said, nobody comes in here and is honest. Nobody comes in here seeking help. They're coming in here trying to get medication. They're trying to get a little manipulation going. And uh, she took me serious. And in that moment, I became Dr. Aspinall's partner. We wrote a book in there. And we began to teach classes together in there. She taught me how to read and write articulately. Uh, and finally, in, I'm, I'm still in what they call uh, the ad sig at the time. Uh, a brother dropped off a bunch of religious books, and one of them was the Quran. Um, along with this Quran was a few other little pamphlets that they had slid under the door. Some of these pamphlets had come way from Africa. And uh, I got these pamphlets, and I was just so amazed. I said, man, somebody then took the Bible and rewrote it and put it in this book. That was my mind when I first read the Quran. Uh so I thought it was really neat the way the stories were unfolding, but I just couldn't understand all these characters and letters. But in the solitude of Asig, the Quran has a voice that can be spoken when you listen. So I began to just write out Al-Fatiha in Arabic. I ended up writing all the way up to maybe Surah 18, all over the walls, right? And when I left... I knew how to read and write Arabic. <laughs> so, so Allah blessed me and did something that he had never done. He had put me on what was called the honor yard and moved me to Lancaster State Prison. And uh, that was when the transition to Islam began. I came looking for somebody that I heard uh, who was a sheikh on the yard. And when he speaks, he rolls his eyes in the back of his head. I said, man, I want to meet that Duke. I want to know what is he looking at when he goes into this head. <laughs> and believe it or not, it was this brother right here. <laughs> it was this brother right here. He may still do it. I catch him every now and then when he's in deep thought, rolling his eyes in the back of his head. But his name 
with Shakir. And they said that this brother would be able to decode some of the things that I had scribbled on pamphlets and papers and things. And I, I literally had scrolls that I had rolled up and taped down with uh, Apple uh, stickers, you know, those stickers off the Apple. So I had a bunch of scrolls and I said, man, if this brother can understand this, then maybe this religion might have some teeth. It might be real. So uh, it took a couple of days because this brother was in a building wherein they was running a dog program. It was a rehabilitated program wherein they was introducing something and this brother was instrumental in that program, introducing it to that prison. Uh, long story short, it took about three or four days to get the brother out. I'm not sure you thought I was mad noon because I just came from the situation, but uh, it took him a few days. And when he finally came out, he said, brother, I heard you've been looking for me. I was right in front of him. I said, yes, sir. It was, uh, it was pretty cold out there. I remember that day. And uh, I said, brother, I just wanted to show you something. I want you to look at it. And what I showed him was, in my mind, I say it's Disney, right? Because I draw things out that I see in words. And I gave him a picture of what I had seen uh, regarding the nur of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa and how he, in that instance, expanded his light and he broke it into these different stages and steps as he began to evolve into the final completion. And when the brother seen it, he said, where did you get this from? I said, brother, I wrote it. No, you didn't. Bro, I, I, by Allah, I wrote it. He said, brother, meet me in the chapel tomorrow. And that was when Islam began to manifest. And finally, the final link was Brother Jesse. Jesse was an anomaly. You know, he came out of nowhere. Big heavy set brother, you know. He comes in there and he has this methodology that he wants to introduce to us. He has this booklet, the Weirdu Alm. The Weirdu Alm. And just the name in and of itself, weird, yeah, they call me weird all the time. What does that mean? So it's just, I love to break things down. And when he gave it to me, we got this book. And I believe it was me and this brother here, Sahi. We began to dissect it piece by piece. Brother said, whoever wins it, whoever memorizes it first, it was some kind of reward or something like that. And uh, I think I was the first mm, to okay. memorize it. Yeah, okay. And that dicker in and of itself, sending prayers and peace upon Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, going through the filters of his stock fear Allah, and then finally coming to the throne of Allah, la ilaha illallah. It was a purifying method in it, and it was a song. It was a rhythm that set off a different frequency that began to change structures, change outcomes within how I perceive life. And these are things that was happening instantaneously. It, it didn't need an argument. It didn't need conviction. It was real. And in that sense, Islam now has become a real thing in my life. Today, I'm currently working after six years of being free from incarceration as a community intervention worker. I work within the West Angeles area of Los Angeles, California. We work with some of the hardest uh, hit areas amongst some of the hardest to deal with individuals. These are gang members, Crips, Bloods, and what have you. And we've been dealing with them intently, resourcing them, getting them to educational programs with these youngsters. We're running gardening. We're running art, music, uh, uh, physical education. We have created the reality in which we dreamed of inside that prison. And uh, the miracle continues as I'm sitting before you all. And uh, this is where the journey continues. And I just thank you all. My name is Abdul Qadir. This is a journey that needs all support. Even if it's just a rub on the back or as this man gave me a hug on the yard and let me know that love was real. As-salamu mm -hmm. alaykum. Let's say this before we give it to Sahri. The ahadith that he had and dissected was the hadith in which Imam Sidi Hamza Yusuf went into the tim tombs of Timbuktu and was instructed to bring to the prisons so he brought it to my co-defendant. So we were the ones who was given. So when he had dissected it fully in Arabic and English and drew it out, uh, that goes to show how Allah Jalla works, that our Sidi, our Sheikh, our beloved, went into the tombs, traveled here, came into the prison system, handed it off to my co-defendant and myself personally. And then inshallah ta'ala, he ends up with it in the a mental war, the insane asylum. SubhanAllah. <laughs>
Ding und schütte auch drei Schuhe. Mit 7 für die. 7,57. I know we're going to break from Mugrin. I just want to also to say one thing. You know, one of the things that I've known uh, most of them for quite some time, for all the time, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> but one of the things about Qadir, which is interesting, is also too, he didn't tell you that he was dyslexic. So when he started reading the Arabic in the other way, it worked for him, right? And then he taught himself how to read. Like, this is, this is like magnificent things, you know? And there's another part that I want to tell you is that when, uh, how the love manifests, right? Even in his life, when he was shot in the face, they actually put him in the, the gurney and they said he was dead. They put him in the hospital and said he was dead. And his mom was so upset that she went over him and she just started saying, my baby, my baby, and hit and hit. And was hugging. I think it was between hugging and hitting, right? If I'm not saying. And the bullet popped out and he came <gasps> And he came back to life. So these are little things that he's not telling that I know that, you know, not to put you out there like that. But these are things, the reality of love. Right. And just his uh, beauty of just, because he would come with like, when I would come to the yard, like to visit, he would come with the most profound questions. And he'd have it drawn all over the board. Hey, look, this is how the hoop of Allah works. And is this how it flows? And it came from, the, you know, like, and it just... I'd never seen anything like it. I said, hold on, I gotta stop for a minute and just look at this. Like it just but he was able to draw it out and he was able to draw things out. And I remember the first day that we did dhikr. And we did just the name Allah. And I remember he came up to me after and he said, Hey, when we did that, something pushed me. I don't know. And he just I mean, that changed that was his whole change, you know. So sometimes you provide the push for people. Like even just you here today, provide some type of push. Mm. Another thing that I've seen when this, because I know we're going to get into Mugrim and then I'm not going to talk anymore. Um, that these brothers, through these types of things, I've seen probably this year at least maybe 100 people take Shahada. Just in a small little area, just by the influence of these individuals just coming into a mosque and just talking. Especially our dear brother Buddha who had a beautiful dream about that before he left. I mean, it's happening, so alhamdulillah. So I just wanted to say that, inshallah ta'ala. You know, and there's so much more of his, of his story in the a whole nother, another one, inshallah ta'ala. So. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rasheem, bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina Muhammadin ashraf al-anbiya'i wa marsaleen, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salam tislima kathira. Alhamdulillah, uh, we're going to continue, inshallah ta'ala, with speaking about some of the lives, uh, or the lives of these individuals, I should say. One of the, the ways of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to actually share experiences that other companions have had. Like he told Salman al-Farisi, like, tell your story, right? And there's a, there's a benefit in us telling stories, especially when they were um, people in the path or the pursuit of truth. So, inshallah ta'ala, uh, you know, please open up your hearts, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, there may be some gifts that we receive from this process. And as our dear brother Tobias has shared, you know, the foundation that was set by his father about trying to find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the midst of everything that he was doing. And then we see it transfer into our dear brother Qadir, we're finding the love, the nur of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that begins to transform him. So now we'll talk with our dear brother Sahi, which was uh, is a profound individual, and also too was uh, the cellmate of Tobias for quite some time as well, the last cellmate, in in a, in a long series of cellmates through twenty eight years. So, alhamdulillah, I'll pass it over to him. Inshallah, ta'ala. Now, Thank you, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that we are all born with a certain disposition towards belief, uh, but it was our parents and our communities that corrupted us and shifted us. Uh, so the stories that you would hear, um, if you meet formerly incarcerated people or people who are still incarcerated, you'll find that there's a commonality that there is a lineage of coming from um, 
communities that are underserved and underprivileged and that are deprived of, of sustenance, you'll find that the examples in which they had in terms of parenthood were the lowest of the low or no parents at all. My narrative, my origin story is very similar to Abdul Qadir's in terms of having uh, parents who are misguided and young and uh, criminalized and uh, abused and found themselves uh, addicted to substances. So it was no wonder that they would bear children that would suffer the same dysfunctions uh, because we were a reflection of our community. I entered the incarceration, I, I entered incarceration at the age of 17 years old. I would, at the time I was a 17 year old gang member uh, involved in uh, street fights and robberies. And then ultimately uh, that activity led to a series uh, of fights that uh, someone lost their life. I was charged with first degree murder at the age of 17 years old. Fast forward a few years, I really just found myself uh, freestyling and trying to acquire a sense of adulthood and manhood uh, that only existed in my imagination. Uh, and finding that I didn't have the appropriate examples. Uh, year after year after year after year until I turned around and I had a body that was an adult, but my cognition was still 17 years old. My emotional state was still 17 years old. My intellect was still rooted in that 17-year-old kid. It's what they call arrested development at its best. It wasn't until, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that after every difficulty comes ease, uh, you know, the constrictions of incarceration can be very brutal right? and it can be compounding and bombarding all at the same time. You know, uh, thinking about ourselves as holistic people, you have um, an emotional self, you have an intellectual self, you have um, a communal self. And when you find yourself at a deficit at every single part of yourself, um, you usually transform into something else. In my case, I tried to adopt uh, things that made me feel whole. Uh, but the things that I grasped at that made me feel whole were emptiness. Um, so I found myself in a cycle around particularly my, my 10th year of incarceration. I was in a cycle. I'd do something that would uh, give me a sense of power. I'd realize that it was false. And then I fall back into the sickness and trying to find the next thing that I could do that would give me a sense of hope or the only thing that shifted was through transferring through a series of prisons and finding myself at a prisons where there was a large community of Muslims um, and recognizing that their culture was dramatically different than what I had experienced up until that point in my life. Different because the vernacular was different. The code of dress was different. The style in which they ate food was different. Uh, the concepts in which they dialogued just on a regular, everyday basis was different. It was something completely outside of the culture and the customs in which I knew at that moment. And it was enough to get me to consider. To consider that there was something outside of the realm of what I had been taught. You know, uh, it took a while for me to see myself uh, or, in, or to, to see myself as a member of this community. Because you come to life with all the baggage. If you don't have uh, a roadmap or guidelines to start to heal some of these illnesses that has uh, attached itself to the heart, then you, you take these things with you. And we see that happen time and time again. Many brothers come to the dean and they still hold on to the hurt and the pain 
the agitation and the strife, even in their Islam, right? And we see it play out in, in prison yards, in the masjids, arguments and fussing, and, and people gravitate towards uh, madhab, uh, uh, con, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Confrontation, right? Because there's not really proper guidance. They're kind of just figuring it out. There's something to be said about having a book, but if the book doesn't have a, an appropriate teacher that can teach you the characteristics of the book or that can walk you through the application of the book and give you example, then you find yourself uh, replicating some of the same destruction, even in the dean. So I found myself at the, in, on the prison yard where I saw this. And I was confused because I was like, you know, these brothers are pretty dynamic uh, in one area. But in the next area, they're just as dysfunctional as everywhere else. Right. Um, I was blessed to be transferred away from that setting. And I was transferred to a prison um, where the brother Abdul Qadir was at. Uh, the brother uh, Shakir was there, and in this setting, I recognized that there was something different because the application, uh, the Quran, had become a practical application. Um, the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had become uh, practical, right? So then I had an example of what compassion looked like, right? Or what seeking ilm actually looked like, what it sounded like, what it felt like. Right. You know, what seeking peace uh, really felt like. And then there was a shift. Now I had a, a roadmap that I could follow. Right. Um, the brother said there's over 300 some odd thousand uh, individuals that are incarcerated Muslims. And we find that in a lot of their settings, these individuals only have books. Unfortunately, they have books that are uh, that speak in a language that does not reflect the reality in which they come from, nor do they have people that come in that will help navigate through some of the things that they've experienced. Right? It's something to be said about having a common language or watching somebody who's done it before, right? And the beautiful thing about Islam is that it's already been tried and tested, right, across the world. But what incarcerated people find is that even though it's been tried and tested, they do not have examples of what's been tried and tested from the people that look like them. So there's a disconnect, right? There's a dramatic disconnect. Um, there's a lot of barriers of why that exists. However, you find those brothers just trying to figure it out. In my case, I was, uh, I was blessed to be around brothers who had tried and tested it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it to work. Right? They saw benefit uh, from, from the work that they engaged in, from the worship they engaged in. Um, you know, Allah says that after every difficulty comes ease. Right? And the interesting thing about that is that that's not just a phrase that happens one time within one's life. Um, I could look back at my time of incarceration and realize that when I was 18, an 18 year old kid, I was in significant difficulty. I didn't know Allah, but Allah allowed that difficulty become an ease. And then I, later on in my life, I found more difficulty and Allah allowed that to become ease. Right. So then we fall into a pattern. And, you know, luckily I was uh, I was able enough to see the pattern play out. Okay, Allah is, is allowing this to happen for a reason, right? Through spiritual development, through community and conversation, I was able to acquire knowledge to say, okay, this is a, this is the thing. This is a test. This isn't just a situation that happens to people. You know, you just find yourself in incarceration, um, and you're stuck. No, this is this is something to develop something. Um, in my time during incarceration, um, especially when. I met Tobias and then later Jesse, I was able to develop because the, the information that they gave me from one was sound. And then two, it replicated the natural human development. You know, when you look at the, 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 the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went through things that were applicable 20 years from now, 
40 years in the future, it's going to apply over and over and over, right? And, you know, the, the brother gave a kutbah today that, that really spoke about uh, the human development. You have to go through a development of tawbah, right? For anyone who's incarcerated, the first step is to seek forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, you've done something to put yourself there. Regardless of the circumstances that squeeze people to make decisions, right? We have to make tauba. So learning about, you know, what the act of tauba is, what, you know, how do you apply it? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? You know, what's the example of what tauba is? Um, and the brother, you know, adamantly every week, week by week by week, walked us through the applications of tauba. Quite believable. And through those applications of Tauba, we start to see things shift in our community, in ourselves, right? In our own personal relationships, talking to our families who usually don't come from Islamic backgrounds, right? They started to witness something different because we were taking accountability for who we were. We were seeking avidly, you know, forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and looking for a format and an application that would relieve the strife off of our hearts. And week after week, this brother would come in and then he would introduce, you know, the salawat. Yeah. And that was so transformative because now, you know, we go from an act of turning, an act of turning, week by week. Now we can walk the path of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And the books just don't become books, or the narrations aren't just books. Now they become things that we could act out in our own lives. And this is only, this is important because we come from places where the script is pre-written, and you just play out the acts of violence, the acts of dysfunction over and over. And you do that because you don't have a format or something that you could see that's tangible. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gives us love, hub. Right, right. The Quran uh, expresses us in detail what Allah loves, right, and that becomes a platform. It becomes a, a, a blueprint that we can literally take inside community and and practice, right. And over that duration of practice, it becomes a part of the identity, right. And a kufi is not just a kufi; it's a part of my identity. A thobe just isn't a thobe; it's a part of my identity now, right. A prayer rug becomes a radical act of, of discipline. And through the path of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the, the teachings that the brother was giving us and that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala provided really opened up a moment where we could see Allah, right? where you know, life, even in those circumstances, uh, felt good. Right, and we're talking about extreme circumstances. I don't want anybody here to think that um, that it was easy by any means. We're talking about the circumstances between having to make salah in between a trash can or a toilet, right? Where if you you don't have any other option, but the love that you feel for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is the the strongest thing that you could ever imagine. So you do what you have to do. That's the type of conditions we're talking about. Right? And somebody has to stand guard when we're in the yard and we want to make salah. Because at any moment, something could drastically shift on the yard and violence can break out. Right? But when we walk the path of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you see Allah, you see him, you hear him, when the wind blows, you know, your reality has shifted. It has changed. There's no other alternative. There's no other alternative. We're not even supposed to be here. Uh, what I didn't say is that I had 50 years to life. Um, I was convicted of that first degree murder. They gave me 50 years to life. And um, I wasn't supposed to be free until 2032. That's when I was supposed to go to the Board of Parole hearings, hopefully get found suitable, and hopefully acquire some time, some terms of freedom. Um, but Allah is the best of planners. 
right? So I'm an avid believer that if you stay faithful, right, if you stay focused, um, if you love Allah, right, whole body, mind, and spirit, that Allah will change the conditions, right? Um, so I've been home for about 100 days now. Um, after getting resentenced from a life sentence uh, to time served after 16 years in prison, on allow, allowed me to be here with you all. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. You know, my hope is that is that you realize that you know this deen is significant. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is significant, right? And He will use you know some of the most mundane things. <laughs> you know, He will use the, some of the most mundane things, things that we overlook and we just don't pay attention to, right? The idea of having a kufi or dhikr beads in a situation where you are deprived of your humanity can mean everything. Because it's not just about um, the system of dhikr or keeping count, but it's a, it's, it's a cultural token, right? It's a little piece of somebody outside of this situation knows that I exist and they care about me. So inshallah, you know, I don't want to hold everybody too long. But my hope is that um, is that we really pay attention to uh, the mundane things and we realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take a lot, a little, and make a lot. You know, he would give uh, the smallest applications an increase. Um, and I, I've seen that play out, hap you know, over and over throughout my life. Wa alaykum <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Thank you for your time. Salaam alaykum. Alhamdulillah. Um, one of the things that Sahih doesn't mention, or I guess maybe they're trying to cover some of their beauty, he's an amazing artist. Actually, his art was in a great gallery in L.A. and put in the L.A. Times. Uh, quite a few. He has, uh, he's an amazing artist. And one of the things that he does is that Tobias would talk about that he would be teaching him and he would be drawing. And Tobias was like, I don't think he's listening. But he was actually drawing out everything he was teaching. <laughs> oh, I mean... Right, so he has this beautiful mind that just swirls and that does these amazing things with calligraphy and with paintings and pictures and especially depicting hurt and how they kind of form and how it, you can transform them and it's just really amazing. That's one of the gifts that he's been given, that Allah has given him in the, in the midst of that struggle and strife. So I want to point that out. Also too many, especially Tobias and I know... Uh, uh, Sahih. There were also two imams in these places, so they had to graduate and they had to build their capacity up to help lead others as well uh, in these situations as imams, and especially as a young imam. You know, in a, in a situation where uh, you're trying to help people discover themselves amongst the codified realities of fiqh and many other things, right? So it's a very interesting place to be, and you have to really push yourself to the limits to find solutions with inside of the beautiful texts that we have been given that are really embodiments of, of faith, you know? And um, uh, what I can say is, uh, you know, you know uh, my, my, my hats are off to these individuals because uh, it's a very complex situation to be in. And, but it has made them men and made them husbands now. And inshallah ta'ala soon fathers. Which, you know, it's really something profound, and inshallah. So this is our dear brother, Muwakil. Um, he's an amazing person. He comes over to my house a lot. Um, yeah, I met his wife, his mother-in-law, and alhamdulillah. As a matter of fact, yeah, I didn't think about it. We, I married both of you guys. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> they got married, and alhamdulillah, he's uh, really innovative because he met a sister all the way in Switzerland when he was incarcerated without, when he wasn't going to get out. And now he's married to her, Moroccan sister. And her father's a shame. So I don't know how you did it, man. <laughs> yeah. So if you guys have any, any issues getting married, you might want to talk to these brothers, because I don't know, somehow they're doing it. They're making it happen. So inshallah tell us. So here, yeah, I'm going to pass it to Waqali. <clears throat> um, I'll uh, start off by saying, like, this moment right here is nothing but 100% proof of Allah's love. And nothing short of that in his mercy. 
I met these guys in the most craziest order. Tobias Holder just started off in Compton, California, where I was born and raised. Where I was a 12 year old kid, where I became homeless. I went from, I like to say, cartoons and cereal to gun violence, and my mind didn't know what happened. And in that moment, I just remember kind of like my grandmother's, her, her teachings was always about like God and either heaven or hell. And even though I really didn't understand Christianity, my perspective was it was just me and God at that moment. I didn't know what else I was going to figure out. I just knew that there was God. There was a lot. And so in that moment, as being a 12-year-old kid, I'm watching my peers. I learned how to steal candy from stores to eat and feed my little sister as we slept on the side of cars in the middle of the night until by the leave of Allah, she was able to find a home. And I didn't want to intervene in that situation, so I just stayed on the streets and allowed her to you know, have her protection there. And I did that for two years until I, I ran into, uh, across this neighbor and he will always have me go up and down the street and ask every neighbor, were they hungry? Did they need anything? And I will grow frustrated with that because my whole theory was just like, mind your business. They said, they say, mind your own, you live alone. Mm -hmm. So I like to stay out of people's business. And I finally asked him one day, like, why, why do you do this? Like, why do you have me do this? And he always said, it's Islam. I'm like, Islam? And so it, it kind of, it, it stuck with me, but it went over my head in the, in the moment as I was going through my experiences until he started paying me to memorize the Quran. And the very first time I remember the Al-Fatiha, and I only remembered it for the benefits, for the money. <laughs> and then I went further into uh, Surah Baqarah, and just remember certain ayahs, but it was only for money. And then I finally told him, like, okay, you don't have to pay me no more for this. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read this. I read not even half of the Quran and I knew I wanted to be Muslim. Cause everything aligned it was just that short section that I read, it aligned with everything that I believed. And so he calls my other neighbor, Umar, and Umar comes and he's like I hear you want to be Muslim. And I'm like, yeah, he's like, did anybody is pressuring you to be Muslim? I'm like, no, I just want to be Muslim. And so he gave me my Shahada. And I remember at that moment when I took my Shahada, all the shame I felt from all the stores I, st I stole from, all the foolish decisions I, di I did, it, it felt like it was just wiped away at that moment. And I remember feeling like this is a fresh start. And then the guy that, um, my neighbor, he was arrested and Umar was like busy working. And I just, I feel like I lost those examples. So I was like, well, it's back to the streets. I don't know where I'm gonna get a song from. And I fell into that whole cycle. And, and I remember there was, there was moments where I had learned part of the Salat and I would just go anywhere and not caring which way I was facing. I was just like, God, just meet me somewhere. And I only knew the al because I remember say the al -Fatiha. And so I would only say the al and I'd just be like, God, I mean, and then shame would come over and be like, oh, you're doing this wrong. He's not answering you. That's why you're in this situation. These negative thoughts would come in, right? And so I found myself hitting rock bottom. I joined the gang while I eventually was <clears throat> hanging out with people and I earned myself a life sentence. First time incarcerated, and I'm like, wow, your first time incarcerated, you have a life sentence. How do you feel? And the judge in my, in my trial, she says that she know that I wasn't a part of anything, but maybe it was God sitting me down to focus. And I remember when she said those words, like I didn't react. It was like some type of serenity that was over my mental. I was only 19 years old. And I was like, wow, homeless straight to a prison cell and this older guy asked me, he's like, so what are you going to do? You're, you're so young. What are you going to do? You got life in prison. And I remember thinking again, I'm like, well, I guess it's just me and God.
now I focus on whatever of this line that I left off on. So I get to prison and I meet one of my brothers for the first time. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. Like, I haven't, I heard about this guy, but I had never in my life met him before. And here we are on the same day, running across each other. So we we go to the mosque, which is the chapel, the square building that they give us to make Salah in. And we, we can utilize that space for an hour. So then I'm like, okay, this is a great start to learn, learning my deen. A lot of my friends came. Everyone was converting to Islam by the leave of Allah. And it was like a good moment. I was able to like slightly distract myself around the stabbings that was going around me, happening around me and just starvation, drug usage, depression, disconnected from the outside world. I was able to slightly look past that by the leave of Allah. And then I was moved to Lancaster because I was I was able to stay out of trouble. But when we got there, my within my first week, I received the news that my lawyer couldn't help me get out despite what my judge said. I have just finished the process of going through federal court with the DA basically backed up and he says, I have no case against this guy because he's not lying. It just, his, uh, his constitutional rights wasn't violated. So he's basically out of luck. And I was like, wow, this is it. Like all this hope that I have built up, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing it to like the work I'm putting in on my Dean as my freedom is supposed to be the result at that moment not knowing that I wasn't ready. And Allah knew that I wasn't ready. So I hit rock bottom again. I'm like, this is not it. And maybe like six months later, I'm skipping the part. I ran across this guy. This guy was talked about a lot in the in the first prison I was in, Calipatria State Prison. And for some reason, it was always 121 degrees out there. And this guy was the only the topic of the conversation and not the heat. So it, that didn't register to me. <laughs> so fast forward, I meet Tobias and I'm, I really make him wait a year before I say something to him to be honest. It was longer than six months. However, I was going through this rock bottom period. I had just lost the um, love of my life. She broke up with me. So I was sick again. I fell up completely off my dean with the court in that situation. I'm just like, this is, I'm over this. This is it's, it's a wrap. I might as well just go for what I know. And that was probably like the first phase of the worst depression I've ever gone through, just gaining so much weight. Just anything, you can name it, I went through. I was doing drugs, just everything. And then I felt a lot of mercy around me. Like he waited until I got over my own selfishness. And he brought me back as a reminder that, that he was with me. And he did this through reuniting with me with all of my friends that had um, converted to Islam. They all came back onto the yard. I started learning all of my deen through dreams. I really wasn't reading anything. And yeah, I will have all everything I learned about Islam, it came through my dreams. And I will always ask Tobias, like, what does this mean? Because this happened. And he was like, you sure you dreamed about that? I'm like, yeah, this, 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 this happened. And then I moved in with him. And then he would try to lecture me about Islam. And I was like, I, I think I just wait for my dream to come. <laughs> and, so, yeah. and so that happened. But then I was still struggling mentally because at that point in time, I started feeling like I messed, maybe I messed up too much in Islam by deviating from the path of, um, of Islam. And I will always compare a lot to a human in the context of when uh, you and a friend fall out, that person may not ever forgive you, so you might as well leave, have, you know, nip it in the bud. Constantly not ever remembering that Allah is bigger than anything that we go through, and he always merciful to those who believe. And he don't judge us the way that humans judge us. So, Oftentimes, my perspective was getting in the way of my own progress. 
And so Jesse came mm. and Jesse brings this uh this little um I'm like like my nafs is saying, Okay, I hear you. Then I'm watching my friends um do it, practice it daily, and I'm waiting for to see results to them. <laughs> Once again, this is my own self, and I'm believing like the whispers of Shaitan, or uh, just blocking my own progress again. And he tells me one day, he like if you if you want to go home, oh, it's out. Um, he tells me, hey, if you're gonna go home, you just, you just do the with um, and then Eskander said the same thing. He says, look, don't look at your situation, focus on the law. And miracles is gonna happen for you. And so I was like, okay, cool. I started doing the Wooden Arm. It, it took me a long time to memorize it. And then something, I, I went through something else, maybe another, another bad relationship for sure. And I remember I was like, okay, Allah, if you're real, show me you're real which was a dangerous question to even ask. <laughs> but I was scaling back and forth between dealing with faith and depression at the same time. And so Tobias, we was went outside to, um, to, to do vicar, and he asked me where we were gonna go. So I picked the most absolutely non-spot to go to, which was by this baseball field, where there's a thousand baseballs come in every time there's a red tape area where it says in big white letters, do not, like, do not post up right here. And all of the officers were outside, standing right there. So we walk all the way around, and we sit there in this big red area that says, do not be right here. And we start making salawats on the Prophet like Salaam. My eyes were closed the entire time. And we were there for maybe like 30 minutes. When I opened my eyes, not one baseball had ever came over there during the game. And the officers actually came around us and was dancing as we made Salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They didn't say not one thing to us. And they were just nodding their heads. And they were just like, <laughs> just doing their little bounce and stuff. I was like, okay. Allah, I'll believe you. <laughs> I'll believe you. And then I, I learned the I learned the widow, um, and I started watching like things progress, like in a in a better way for my life. And so that made me believe, like no matter what state I find myself in, that Allah is always with me. And it, it made me feel like. Like we should never, ever, ever, ever justify abandoning the law because of our state or whatever we're experiencing, whatever moment that we feel like is super tough. Like Jesse reminded me that somewhere in the, in the Quran, Allah says, "Like um, with constriction comes expansion." And that sat, that sat with me for a long time because I always felt like life was always squeezing me, like there was never a break. It was always constant pressure and constant test, constant test, constant test. I'm like, where is the expansion going to come? Like, this is always constriction until all of this pays off and I get a call from the governor's office saying that, hey, we heard about your situation and we want to give you a shot to go to the Board of Parole hearing to get out. And the funny thing about it, it was on this Friday the 13th day, the way I always believed as a kid growing up, like this was like this bad superstition day. So I'm like, wow, that's kind of that's kind of different. Like these are statements. I feel like these are statements from a law being made. And then I had a cell phone in prison. In prison, we're not allowed to have cell phones at all. Even though we're just using it to connect to our families, they paint a narrative that. We're calling to get somebody whacked, killed, or just some type of crazy narrative. And it's really you just searching for a connection. 
And I was on Instagram and I DM'd my wife, Miriam, who was a friend then. And she would always say like, yo, I'm having these dreams. We're gonna get out. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. She will always just speak life into my situation. Always, always, always. I'm like, how do you know? You don't, you don't know anything. Like, you don't know the situation at hand. And she's like, I don't know what's going on, but Allah's telling me you're going to come home. So you just need to, to focus on Allah and, and all these beautiful things. And so it made me just, it, it, it constantly reminded me that that I'm not the only one in this situation for one. And also with that, with, I can talk for hours about our relationship and just learning this long. But right in this process of when I got this call from the governor, or I think it was like before I had two, no, I had three powerful dreams. And as soon as I seen Jesse, I ran to him to the gate and I told him about this dream. I think I told you about all of them. But on this day, I told you about the one of the Prophet Salih Wasallam. And he gave me some encouraging words. And then next thing you know, I'm getting called out to be released. And the whole time I'm thinking like, is this fake? Like they finna call me back. It's a mistake, it's a mistake. And then they open the door and I step out and I see my family. And I'm thinking like, wow, like this is, this is crazy. But I missed the part before this even happened Tobias had got his sentence committed and he will always say like there's a formula and the formula always consisted with Allah. It, it didn't consist of anything else. And he will say, you know, do these dickers for me. I'm about to go to board, do these dickers for me. I'm like, all right, I got you, I got you, I got you. And then he got out. So that also like was a reminder that like even in a sense this moment for us, there was days where I always used to, there's this basketball court in the middle of the yard. And I would lay there and I would always look at the sky because the sky was the closest thing I had to freedom. I would constantly like like lay there and look and and feel like this is the only connection I have to humanity and society outside. Because we can all look up and we can all see the same sky. But when I look down, we had two different realities. And so when I started seeing him, when, I, when he went home, that also was a reminder that it, it's only Allah. So no matter what's going on around us, Allah removes and he removes things to replace it with greater things. And sometimes we would get so attached to that one thing that we're holding on to that we don't want to let go of it so he can replace it with something greater. And then it ends up harming us because we already evolved, that Allah, Allah seen us evolve that, that situation but if I would have held on to those things, those whatever those small little moments of gratification, like having a cell phone or or hanging out with certain people, if I was held on to that, I would have never able to let go and Allah would have replaced that happiness with freedom. And so I think like everything has been a, a consistent narrative of when you're at the lowest of your lows. Allah is always there waiting for you to pick up as long as you reach out for him. Instead of being at your lows and just reaching for the ground for your next movement, how about reaching up and reaching out for Allah so he can pick you up instead of trying to pick yourself up all the time. And so that's just one thing that that's that's the main thing that, that this whole entire journey has been and, and now we're all here. And even before when bro got out, I kind of felt there was like this um, survivor's guilt that I would go through. I would always go through it because him and I were always together. When I was going through like self-discovery process of understanding how did I end up in a situation like prison or trying to piece up things in my life to take accountability for for ending up in prison. He was right there, we, we took a class and we had to face these issues about how did abandonment influence our negative decisions or how did 
like what they call narcissistic injuries or which is nothing but interpretations of your hurt and you feeling like well not even like when you experience something that's unjust the first question that comes up to your mind is why me right and then you may respond to that like I, I did I responded to those questions with aggression that often led me into trouble and so sitting in sitting in this room having to take accountability and say like I had the power to make the decision, but I lacked the knowledge to make a positive decision. It, it was hurting to say, like, yeah, you were that idiot. Even though Allah saw me as something greater than the idiot, I always see myself as that. But he was right there, and I, I would, like, go in the bathroom, and I would just cry. I'm like, damn, like, you fucked up. And excuse my language. But I would feel that way. And I, we went through this whole journey, until, and, and we found healing through Islam. And self discovery, and so when I came home, I felt like, like I left him, or like it was it was survivor's guilt. And then when I went and seen him, I was driving home, and I just like started crying on the freeway. I'm just like, dang, like, like he's still there. Like you get to leave, and he's and he's still there. And and the only solution I had was just like a lot. Like like there wasn't much I can do. I'll call all of my friends who were in situations. In position to help nothing. I didn't know how to tell him, but I had to go to sleep with that reality. Like, I'm, all I can say is like, only Allah can help you. Just that's it. Like, no, none of us. We've 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 come, we've done all that we can, and in the past we've done all that we could. So it's only Allah. O only thing we can do is stick to that one formula, <laughs> Allah. And then it happened. And I'm like. It happens again. <laughs> Allah scores again. <laughs> and so now he's here with this. And it's like, it's, it's beautiful. So to see that when our situations in life count us out, like having life or losing, losing all that we perceive we have, looking up to Allah and saying, okay, I may have lost this, this, and this, and this, and it looks like I have nothing. I have the source of everything. So I really didn't lose anything. I just feel as if I lost something. Like, that's the key. And so, before I give the mic to, back to Jesse, one, I would, think, I would like to thank all you guys for being here and being a part of this moment right here that we're all sharing, this intimate moment. I would like to also remind you, like, no matter what's going on in the world, everything happens with a reason. Even if we can't see it, even if we can't understand it, Allah says in the Quran, I will clarify everything for you on the day we meet up. You're not going to know everything. So let's accept that. There's things that we need to let go of that we're just not going to know, and it's okay to not know. The things that we do know, He leaves trails for us to, to understand the differences amongst each other are to learn the other things it's for him to clarify that he says he's going to clarify it and so I, I would just like to leave that with you guys but also invite you guys to help and be a part of this journey of us going back and helping the same People in our situation, because it's it's nothing better than really helping out the members of your community, especially if you see the law. Like our community, we are going to be questioned on the day of judgment about what, what did we do for each other. Like I may have just met you today. I know I have rights with you, and you have rights over me. We have obligations over each other. And that's the beautiful thing about Islam. That it has this connection. So even in prison, or no matter where we're at, that's, that's, that's a member of our community. No matter how he pray or what he does in his spare time, these small little rights that we have, we can carry out. Fix it be the law. And Allah rewards us for it. And so if it wasn't for Jesse coming back 
and giving us this information, Allah who Allah will be. I don't even want to know. But we're here. And I love that part. <laughs> so, Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to open up for q and A. Q&A. Um, I just want to make a concluding remark. I'm going to pass it off, I guess, probably to my wife real quick. Inshallah ta'ala. Uh, but please formulate your questions. But, um, you know, one of the things I remember when I first went to meet uh, everybody here, I remember I was giving a speech about something, about just the community and trying to get the information out about the prison phenomenon. And I remember Tobias was very disgruntled. And uh, it would be served right because of doing, you know, almost 30 years in prison and you don't get any help from the outside community. It would really frustrate you amongst everybody. That was pretty much a consensus in most of the prisons that I've gone to across the country. And, you know, we're a developing community. And especially me being outside now, I understand a lot of the complexities. But it's something that's not really recognized. But... I remember he was very frustrated and, you know, we get to the point that myself included at one point was like, ah, I'm not really going to deal with the community too much. I'm just going to kind of do my thing. And I remember I mentioning uh, a little bit about Prophet Islam talking about being part of the community, right? And that a person that is amongst the jama'at, even with all its dysfunctions, is better one than the purified one alone, Right. And I saw that transform something in his consciousness, right? And he never mentioned about that again and made a shift. And, you know, because he, he had opportunities to go over to South Carolina, to go to different places and be that purified one, which he is, in, in, a, in a different place, inshallah ta'ala. But he chose to come to L.A. And I saw also, too, a beautiful thing spur out of Abdul Qadir as well from just a little bit of interaction that he felt that he could make a change in this community. He felt that he could guide some of the, the youth that have been misguided out there and that he would put himself on the line, which he has, against <laughs> great odds <laughs> uh, for my dear friend Abdul Qadir. And if you knew the story completely. And also, too, I've seen the, the same situation with Sahih, that through art he would want to help transform individuals and help them heal in their process. And our dear dreamer here, um, he's a dreamer. And that's one thing that I can say. And I've seen his dreams come true, which I watched his presence in the masjid bring about four to 500 more people into the masjid. And I just didn't know how it would happen. But he had the dream, and, and it happened. So, you know, but one of the stories that was interesting when I first came in to see them was this one brother. I don't remember if you guys remember Dawood, but he was an older guy. And they said, do you know who that is? And I was like, yeah, I, I don't know. He's like, man, and it was this Shahid told us. This is another brother who was incarcerated now for life, and he was one blessed brother. He said, yeah, he was given a khutbah one day, and all of a sudden on the minbar, somebody came up and stabbed him. And he said he stabbed him, and I remember how he had the show. I can't remember the, I'm trying to get that word's real name, but he got cut here. And he said, yeah, the brother went up and just stabbed him on the minbar. I'm like, oh, my God. And he said they took him out on life support, the air helicopter. And they said when they were going in the wound, there was a cancer. They said if he didn't stab you, we would have never found this cancer and it went to your, it went to your brain. I was like, wow, that's a heck of a stabbing. Yeah, that's the proper one, right? So, you know, so sometimes life, when it stabs you a little bit, when Allah sends somebody to... You know, it, it could be something. So what I mean by to say that is that there's always something happening for a reason, whether we understand it or not. And there's beautiful miracles of how they unify us. So inshallah ta'ala, I just want to pass the mic to my, my wife and, and uh, his, uh, Tobias' uh, sister to experience just from the female perspective real quick. Inshallah ta'ala, and then open up for Q&A. So another just five minutes. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shema. Um, as he said, I'm his wife. Um, I just want to say thank you to this entire MCC East Bay community for welcoming us with open arms and being so receptive to everything that these brothers are saying. Um, I met Jesse about two years ago at Masjid Omar in Los Angeles, and um, I saw he had a prison outreach program, and I was like, oh, I'd like to volunteer for that. <laughs> and Allah gave me my dua. 
I married him, and um, I ended up meeting Shaq. He came out here. He gave the commencement speech. I had no idea what Zaytuna was. Um, got to meet Imam Zaid and uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. May Allah bless them and reward them. And I met Qadir. And then Buddha came out, and I met him. And then I met Sahi. And um, I just saw all of their different stories. And through Link Outside, um, people always ask me, like, what do you do? Like, what does your organization do? And basically, in a nutshell, we give hope to those that are hopeless. You know, we let them know that Allah loves you, we love you. There is a community out here that will love you when you come out. And no matter what you have done, there's always something that Allah will do for you that will show you his love and mercy. And um, one example of that is a sister, her name is Maria. She might be watching right now. She was in prison for 27 years. She started doing that uh, time at 41 and she came out. Uh, about six months ago, and last week we were able to take her to her first Joma, and she was one of the sisters that came out through the Link Outside program. And it just goes to show you with every letter that is written, with every um, donation, with every dua, because that is the most important thing you can do is pray for these brothers and sisters that it makes an impact, it makes a change, not only in their lives, but in yours as well. And I have seen that firsthand. Um, a lot of times brothers and sisters write us like, oh, can you tell the head of this uh, organization to please? And it's just a couple of us. Just with very little resources, alhamdulillah, Allah has put so much barakah in order for us to be able to do so much. Um, but there is so much more that needs to be done and that can be done. And um, inshallah, you know, that may Allah, you know, reward you all for coming. And inshallah, that we're able to help more brothers and sisters just like this that are behind the wall right now praying that people like you can see them, can hear them, can feel them, and inshallah that they're able to get an opportunity to come outside and create a better life for themselves and become their best, so, you know, they become their best selves. So may Allah reward you, and inshallah just know that um, Allah is capable of all things, and they're an example, you know, up there. <laughs> Every single one of them, including my husband, who also he was in prison, it goes just to show you that never count anybody out. You never know someone is stationed with Allah, and that is when Mamzad here with somebody says, Shema, you see somebody, you never know they're stationed with Allah, and that they are the perfect example of that. And so, um, inshallah, we all, you know, always gather together in remembrance of Allah and the Rasul, and may Allah bless and preserve you. And inshallah, we gather here again in the future um, with more great news and more uh, beautiful stories like theirs, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I will pass it off to Tahira who was on this journey way before me, the sister of Tobias, and uh, she will share her story with you as well. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, mm, my brother Jesse made us get on the mic, and um, it's a little difficult for me because um, I have a lot of jumbled emotions right now. So whatever I say, I first ask Allah to guide my words and my intentions and um, they may seem a little fragmented but I'm just going to speak on the things that um, I guess are at the forefront of my head so the first thing is that um, I have inherited Jesse and Shema as family and link outside as family including Jesse's mom um, because when Tobias went in um, Unlike a lot of his uh, incarcerated peers, he had a lot of family that supported him. Um, I was in high school at the time, and literally I'd spend summers going to visit him in the worst prisons, um, calling Dawa Books in L.A., trying to get oils, and calling the prisons, trying to get um, Eid approved, Eid celebrations approved, you know, and not just me, our family, and very limited people. So... I just happened to be at uh, Jesse and Shema's one day, and um, um, <laughs> I'm just chilling, you know, eating all the fly food they make, you know, alhamdulillah, like just chilling. And I see them pull out these stack of letters, and I was like, oh, what you guys doing? And they were like, yeah, this is for Link Outside. I said, oh, you all volunteer with Link Outside? You know, I had seen them on Instagram, followed them. I was like, yo, now there's an organization that does this, subhanAllah. And they were like, yeah, we kind of our link outside, you know, us and, you know, partner and da 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 And it's like, subhanAllah, and I literally cried at their table because it is vital for the ummah to support those who are seeking deen in the worst 
of situations. And a lot of times those of us on the outside see ourselves so far beyond or removed from those situations. But I, I really ask you to look at the lives of the Sahaba. Like these weren't all pristine uh, characters who led pristine lives. Some of these had some real dirty bumps and bruises, you know? And um, so I'm constantly thinking about what our role is to support those who don't have the resources um, to seek this thing that we do. And then, as the brothers have said, I also ask that we not take it for granted. Because I will say, I feel like my cancer, Jesse, was that as I'm dealing with my brother, who's was my best friend, my teacher, although sometimes it's like, oh, which is my teacher, though? You know, but alhamdulillah, he was. Um, it would, especially when it came to this dean and the dab of this dean. Um, while I had to deal with that, there were things that were coming out of that prisons in the term of Islam that I would not have sought as a teenager um, otherwise. And I, I mean, uh, truly Allah knows best. But that was, that was my stab in my cancer. That there are things that I hear in Qutbahs now that I'm like, man, the Ox were writing me about that in, you know, 98. You know what I mean? And it was just like, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, you know. Um, so that that was one thing. The other thing Allahu is that, Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الحمد لله I'll make this last part quick the other thing that I want to quickly say is that these ox that are up there um, they talk about their past a lot but they haven't talked as much about their future. So I'm also fortunate enough to work with all five of them um, within some of the, I don't wouldn't say the worst areas of LA, but they get a little grimy. And these brothers are all very talented and brilliant and within their own right, by the grace and mercy of Allah. And they choose every day to reach back and to try to teach these other little cats that look just like them, guys and girls, and help them to tune into something bigger than themselves. And that is one of the most remarkable things I've ever witnessed in my life. And to see these youth who really represent the heart and soul of them, whatever didn't get touched when they were that age is getting touched now with these kids who probably wouldn't listen to anybody else, which again, truly Allah knows best. And that is just upon Allah. And I want to commend you all for that because it's beautiful to see. It's beautiful to see. And Kadir, you made a point at this last orientation that, you know, Alhamdulillah, we were able to secure a house a beautiful home, create a beautiful space by the grace and mercy of Allah. And Kadir during orientation told them, the reason we're doing this at a house and not a quote community center is because most of the dysfunction starts right here at the home. 
So what we're going to do is recreate some things. We're going to recreate some patterns. We're going to reestablish relationships. We're going to understand what it is to care for a house, to care for a home. And that means the people in it. And then Jesse and Shema come in and they have classes there so that we also infuse Islam in there, even though to some degree right now we can't directly give it to the children, but they know we're all Muslims. They see how we walk. They see what the expectations are. And for you all to choose that, because now you have your lives back, you know, you could choose anything and you all choose that every day. And it is not easy. It is not easy. And so Alhamdulillah, may Allah greatly reward you all, bless you all, heal you all, preserve you all and keep you all and your families for the work that you're doing and the intentions that you have. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, we have Q and A. So, any questions that people may have, Inshallah, Taala, for you know uh, the brothers up here, or even Tahira or Shema as well, or any of the questions about kind of what we offer. So, just in the gist, we offer not only uh, correspondence, not only courses, not only uh, I guess you would say cr uh, character development and in-person visits, but also to uh, we offer re-entry services and we also to offer community development overall. We've had some help from the state. We've also too had some help from the Muslim community. Um, but primarily most of our things are volunteer based. Um, inshallah ta'ala we're working towards um, getting everybody, you know, at least uh, provided with resources for the services that we offer. And I'll be honest with you, you know, one of the things I went to a community in your Belinda, and usually this happens in well-to-do communities. You know, they say a lot of times, you know, it's actually not really about the resources. It's like, are you really committed to doing the work? It was a very interesting thing I heard. I was like, yeah, I don't know. This, you know, um, but it's it's interesting because that's that community that sometimes this work is seen as lower. It seemed as not like. You know, are your kids going to do it now? They're not. Maybe they're going to become a doctor, engineer. A lot of people are not going to take up this type of work, which is the most essential. Because as our communities are beginning to decline in both areas, it doesn't matter if it's downtown L.A. or it's up here in the Berkeley Hill because it's happening. Um, who's going to take up the work to hold the moral ground? From And also to who, where's the unique personality is going to come from to kind of cross-pollinate, as they call it where we begin to have this interaction and it empowers you somehow and then also to empowers us because I think you've seen very clearly uh, m some of you may not have cried but some of these brothers have cried because there was a healing in this process of just exchanging this story right and that happens in this interaction that we have these little s subtle things remember we were in Egypt me and my wife someplace and um, I asked the guy we went to this place in Hamathra way out in the desert and I said, did you see any miracle happen today, like when we were here? And he said, yeah. He said, when I was sitting down, I got really tired. I was next to a person. And I'd never seen him before. He said, I'm, I'm usually in this area, so I never saw him before. And he said, I got hungry. And all of a sudden, he looked at me and he said, are you hungry? And I said, yeah, I'm hungry. He said, okay, I got some food coming soon. And he said, in my mind sprung this dish that only comes from Aswan, which is about six hours away. And he said, I really started craving it really badly. And he said, all of a sudden, the man comes up that was supposed to come with him with the food, and it was the same dish from Aswan. And, and that moment, and he said, I, was so, I felt so indebted to him. And he said, you came. And he bought these books in Arabic, and, I didn't, and he didn't know if I know how to read them. But he said, you bought these books in Arabic, and I, I felt... Oh, man, I wish I could give him something. And he said, well, you bought the books for the price, and then you put extra money on top, and that fulfilled my wishes. He said, that was my miracle for today. And you don't really know what miracles you're bringing to people. You don't know what miracles you bring to us, what miracles we bring to you. But it's only in these interactions that this miraculous reality begins to actually manifest. You know, these are really, uh, you know, miraculous moments. And there are certain moments sometimes where... You know, like, I give you one more miracle today. Please ask a question. Raise your hand and stop me. Today, I gave the khutbah today. And after the khutbah, there's this man that comes up. And he says, I've seen you before. You were in San Jose. I'm like, nah, I wasn't in San Jose. Maybe somebody looks like me. He said, no, 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 no. You were in San Jose. And I'm like, no, I wasn't. But maybe somebody looks like me. 
He said, no, no, no. You and your wife were praying in the parking lot on the side of the road. I saw you and came and prayed with you. You don't remember that? I said, now I remember that. I didn't know it was San Jose. So, <laughs> you know, and, and that was that. And it was me with my wife. And it's probably like, how does that happen? What's the chances of that if you put that on a mathematical equation? That the man who's giving the khutbah would see this individual and that would happen and that would come together and he would remember that. And what's the chances of me being there with him today? Is that not a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there's some tawfiq happening? To remind you of these beautiful things that are always happening all the time. You know, so it's, it's just these things. And he's got a question. Asif, my man. Okay, alhamdulillah. No, here, take it, please, here. Oh, Oh, Medina. Okay, so you, you have some. There you go. Hmm. Assalamu alaikum. I try to give you this before uh, the salat. I was blessed, not this umrah, but the umrah before the opportunity not only to go myself, but to choose a person to go to umrah. Uh, this is big because I have a father, I have Islamic family. I got about a hundred brothers on the street right now. So I make dua, Ya Allah, please instruct me who to take. And he told me to take a person who would least likely be able to go on his own. And it was a brother, our brother named Bomani. Bomani. Bomani comes from South Central Los Angeles in prison at a very young age. Very violent lifestyle. Prison, very violent lifestyle. One of these brothers. And so, inshallah ta'ala, I invite Bomani. Bomani at that point has never been out of Los Angeles for one, except into the various prisons. And up here to Zaytuna, I think is when I gave the commencement. Uh, he met the, all the shoe, and they called him the Red Angel because he had all red clothes on. And so, uh, you know, like we're going to Mecca and Medina. You know, this is stuff, not so much for me, but like for him, this is stuff you read in the book. And so when we get to Medina, you know, Bomani is fully tatted with tattoos from his neck on down. SubhanAllah. And so in Mecca, he didn't have any problem. Or it was the other way around. It was Medina. Alhamdulillah. And so seeing Bomani often literally getting attacked. Kufar, Kufar, Mushrik, you got tattoos. They're like, what, Mushrik? And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm talking about this. And me and Jesse's, because Jesse and I was there as well, our approach was to allow Bomani to experience Mecca and Medina in his own way, not how Jesse, well, when Jesse travels the world, and he goes to Maqams, and he's sitting these long lectures and speeches. You know me, I'm just blessed to be hanging out with y'all. So we wanted him and Bomani stepped into the space and he said that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Imam of that town, he is the Sheikh of that town, he's the Habibi of that town and he was welcome and you can only come by invitation and that's what he was told that you can only come to Medina by invitation and Allah Azza has invited him by invitation and he ran into the uh, the master of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam after the short uh, surrounded us, inshallah. And, yeah, literally, me, Jesse Wolf. I'm just watching this unfold, and they're debating amongst each other what, what they're going to do with Bomani. I'm reciting Surah Yasin, Yasin. When I call you're from where are you from? America. Brother, how do you know Yasin? Like, how does any Muslim know Yasin, bro? I recite it. So they're really perplexed. The point of this was, Bomani had befriended all the taxi drivers. And when they see him, Bomani! All of them. I'm talking, we're talking about like 50 taxi drivers. Bomani had went through the whole city and made new friends. This is on Umrah. Going under the notion that this is Muhammad's town, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm a Muslim and I am work and welcome to this town. By himself, not with me and Jesse, he went back into the place where he was just accosted and ridiculed for having tattoos with tears in his eyes. He went into the masjid of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He faced the station of the Rasul and he said he spoke to the Rasul and he thanked them for the first time in his life 
regardless to being harassed in prison, regardless to being harassed by LAPD, regardless to being harassed in Medina, this is the first time in his life that he felt literally free. And so this is what happens. Yes, what the brothers have said, us inside of prison, us being connected to the brother Jesse, where we have created Link Outside, Link Outside through our brother named Abdul Salam, which is, you know, our sheikh and good brother, which is the student of Imam Hamza. And this is how the story started. The brother asked me two things. We're co-defendants. We're on the same case. He said, my mother's going to die. <clears throat> uh, bury my mother and make sure Jesse reads Yasin over her body. And go tell Imam Hamza Yusuf these words. His mother passed. And Jesse read Yasin over her body. One year after I got out, I met Sidi, Hamza Yusuf. And I was able to tell him those words. That has birthed not only the Bomanis to go to the Hajj, inshallah. Well, I know my little sister was mad at me, so I invited her <laughs> the, year, the year later. So my younger sister and the brother Jamal, uh, we was able uh, to go. Uh, so yes, alhamdulillah, uh, the main thing about the journey was to read about the Kaaba, to read about the sacred sites of Mecca and Medina, and then to be able to take men and now women to experience it on their own terms and go through ridicule and find Muhammad وسلم, in the love of Muhammad, in the protection of Muhammad, alhamdulillah. So yes, uh, that was one of the practical uh, stories. And I'm pretty sure that young brother, I texted him yesterday, uh, that's what he still holds on today as he's navigating his journey. So any uh, questions uh, for any of the brothers, please do. Uh, I'm not going to say people's names, but uh, they know uh, my voice, my tears, my everything that we have been able to accomplish. We appreciate uh, the love and hospitality that this community, Zaytuna, uh, Sidi Hamza has done. Yes. Please. So I just want to ask you, there is a Tayyiba Foundation here in the Bay Area. Do you have any, like, uh, is there any, like, being, uh, any connection with it? Or, like, because they, I think they do similar work, like yeah. the same we do. And uh, I feel like when you both maybe work together, it's, you're going to become with a better result. Yeah, um, one of the things we, we, we do, uh, I know Sheikh Rami well. I was in Washington, D.C. with him at the hearing uh, for um, petitioning the rights of, of individuals, especially for their religious rights in, in when it comes to p penal institutions. Um, we are just a little bit different than them in that capacity. Yes, we do work together. We do uh, do a lot of joint uh, ventures together. We're a little bit more on the ground uh, when it comes to community development, when it comes to especially like in LA, like what you see. Um, so we do have curriculum, we have some of the same stuff, and we do reference when individuals write us that they want to take certain classes and courses that we make sure that that information gets to them, that we coordinate them with them, we do those things. Um, there's just a little bit of difference when it comes to an overall community development because we've had the opportunity by the, the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to actually put some of our I guess you would say methodologies into formation or into a practical implementation in a strategic area and watch the results happen. Um, and it just really primarily came through the reality of love, changing what's up on the minbar, changing some of the dynamics of how people feel when they come into the masjid overall. And you saw the response begin to happen, right? So we had it from, we call it from bars to minbars, right? So. We take a lot of individuals, such like Tobias has gone a lot of places, not just at the commencement speech and spoke. We've had this type of panel of a few places, but also to them giving Khatira during Ramadan and beginning that process as well and showing some of the beautiful uh, gems that individuals hold with inside of themselves from these, these ones. So we do work with them, just to tell you like that. But also too, even with Table Foundation, they have a limit as, as much as we do, right? So there's 350,000. So a couple more um, organizations, it ain't gonna hurt, you know. Primarily, the only two that you hear is us and them. 
Um, and there's a couple other ones in, in, the, in the country, but primarily, because like I give you an example, I have a contact list of like 5,000 people this year. And so it's growing, and we've set up a system kind of like the international aid charity, primarily off a of volunteer base. But we have to kind of take it to the next level because what we can do through the process, especially of the Sakat system that we have in these different communities, is this is one that falls in the category. And individuals that have been affected by incarceration should be employed and, 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 and I guess you would say not only just employed, but also to elevate it in the way that they're educated and everything to take on and handle these issues because there's going to be certain particulars that they're going to understand uh, about the emotional needs of these individuals, about the, the realities in which they come from. They're going to be actually able to handle those questions in the proper way, right? And so given access to places like this in Zaytuna and stuff like that, when we'll open up that other portal that they have that's that's right there potentially if given the the the, the proper nourishment right so alhamdulillah so I, I just wanted to say that yes we do, i do know about the, the organization um is there any other questions before salah on anything no alhamdulillah so the organization is link outside you can go to www www link outside we have pamphlets as well Inshallah ta'ala. Um, but please, the oh. biggest thing is keep connection with us. So even if there's like a contact list sheet that we can keep connection because the, the necessity for this, for our community, you know, I just got like a call the other day about uh, a kid in Irvine trying to join a gang in LA, right? And this is starting to happen because of, it's not so much about the gang reality in and of itself. It's really just about the need for connection. And there has to be this cross-pollination that happens because this is how it just builds community. A lot of times we come in here, it's a crowd, it's not a community. It's just a crowd. We just rush in, usher in, you know, community, you might see us, you might see a few. This is a community, right? And this is the community. But we have to begin to strategically do things to make them more, make people feel more at home, more welcome as well. Inshallah. Salam Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for the insight what goes on behind the walls and how the community can help, you know, so I deeply appreciate that. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for coming for 150 miles. Uh, Negro, Sacramento. Protect them. Protect them. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Our father's cousin, and uh, this morning his father's trying to get here to his dear friend and comrade Rosie yeah. here today to see this take place. So I come to you back. Thank you as well. Assalamu alaikum. This is it's amazing. Amazing because I, when I lived in Sacramento for nine years, this is one of my loves right here. And then to have that connection with you, he told me the relation. I'm like, man, we were on Umrah together. And uh, But I want to say something to all you brothers. Um, it's, it's a beautiful witnessing. And I don't want to like just pump you guys up. But the reality is you guys are superheroes. Like we live in a, a society of children and we all have these superhero, fake superheroes on TV, the Wolverine, X-Men or whatever. You guys are the real, the real deal. And it's uh, inspiring to me. And, um, you know, a few times I already want to cry. Every time I get to where I'm Tobias, I cry. And, um, but alhamdulillah, what you guys are doing and for us now to have a chance to be a part of that, be a part of your leadership and what you guys are doing it is, a, is amazing. It's amazing because it's, you know, we can all think about how we can help and how we could be a service and this and that and, and how we're supposed to be, you know, for our communities and with each other. And now what we have put together is it's amazing. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.